They say never judge a book by its cover, but I was recently watching a video from Anthony Fantano and he jokingly said this. I don't know what it is about papyrus font. Like if you want to know something is going to be bad music from the outset, just look for papyrus font. Just look for it. If you find it, like guaranteed it's going to be sh That made me think. Does the typography and overall quality of graphic design of an album's artwork actually correlate with the quality of the music? Let's get nerdy and do some analysis. Let's talk methodology. I compiled a spreadsheet of the 100 best-selling studio albums of 2002 with aggregated scores. Why 2002? Well, it was a very definite era in graphic design, the grunge era, not to be confused with the musical grunge era. But needless to say, it means we're going to see some pretty awful fonts. Also, 2002 was the year that I finished high school, so there's definitely some nostalgia at play. This won't be as methodological in its scoring as my logo shootout videos. There's just far too much stylistic variance between the different cover artwork styles. And so it's going to be more of a overall gut feeling when it comes to ranking. That having been said, the following factors are definitely going to be at play. First, the overall composition. Uh, secondly, typography, that is the fonts they've used and how they have used them. And then finally, how successful have they executed the original kind of intent of the designer. Uh, if it's intended to create a certain mood, has it done that well? At the end, we're gonna compare the average score for albums within each tier according to data from All Music's Critic Score and Rate My Album's User Score. Why those particular sources? Because they were the easiest ones for me to scrape with my basic Google Sheets functions. With that said, let's get into the ranking. Okay, so beginning in rough alphabetical order, we begin with NSYNC for that apostrophe, and we have Justin Timberlake and his friends here using one metric buttload of hair product. This album cover is a pretty competently done photo collage. Um, there's no kind of terrible Photoshop work of angles that don't make any sense or, or really bad shadows here. So I think we're gonna start off with a solid B. So following that, we have Alia's self-titled album, and it's pretty good. It's pretty timeless looking. The only thing that really gives away what era it was made in is the transparency effect on the type. There's also some customization of type here with the crossbars removed from the A's. Pretty subtle, pretty tasteful, very, very of its era. We have that multiple stroke effect going on on the orange and black type. We have this kind of motion blur going on underneath it as well. And the type itself is very, um, a very typical display font for something youth targeted uh, around this time period. So Alanis Morissette is featuring a style that became quite big in the mid 2000s, which is this very colorful auto vectorized uh, illustration. Could be a whole video about abuses of auto trace. There's just a lot of extraneous detail in here which actually detracts the overall composition. Like these little blue flecks you see throughout are just extraneous anchor points that were created by the auto trace feature which nobody bothered to go and clean up. Why have they put the album name in Vedana? And with a custom A that is a uh, capital that raises a lot of questions. It's a mystery that nobody cares about. I mean, overall, this design is actually quite cool. And there's clearly been some work crafting this uh, logo graphic with the ant. And then it looks like they printed it onto some kind of old rag and ran it over with a truck for absolutely no reason, except this was the style at the time. The motion blur <laughs> tool must have been fairly new because you see it come up fairly often. And here, someone has gone absolutely ham with this filter and just done the whole thing. It leaves a really disorienting, dizzying effect. And it more seems like a lame attempt to try to create something of like, oh, the world is rushing by her and she's standing still, which a long exposure film photograph would have achieved much better. I suppose that the chicken scratch lettering does kind of signal the attitude that she's giving, but I've definitely seen better lettering than this done on the back of a toilet stall door. So I'm gonna have to say, see you later, boy. They look kind of like an esports team, <laughs> the way that they are uh, posed in, in their matching outfits. 
big timers here are again showing us the perils of early Photoshop filter abuse. This 3D rendered lettering is quite confusing in effect. They've used a font beneath that, which is meant to mimic the raised lettering of a label maker, uh, the Dymo style label maker, I think, but added this strong outer glow to it. There's also some other confusing elements going on here. It's just a little bit of a dog's breakfast. Also some early 3D work going on in her logo and quite a bit of drop shadow, but overall it's a lot less heavy handed than what we just saw. I would not have picked this font for Britney. It's a little delicate actually. It's, it's kind of this Victorian era display font. The overall execution is excellent. They've applied this very strong kind of colorized look to the cover. The CMYK is striking and perhaps even a little bit um, neon day glow. Overall, kind of surprising, but I like it. Speaking of liking, because I'm the only Linus on YouTube with smooth segues, leaving a like will be something that really helps the channel and I'd greatly appreciate it. Given the time, this was not quite the cliche it would become. Uh, I may be wrong about that, but this also was done analog. It wasn't a digital composite and I kind of find that a bit charming. Um, I like that somebody had to take these separate photographs. They didn't just kind of do it all in post-production. Now I briefly touched on what grunge design was in the introduction, but nothing can better explain it than seeing this album, which just uses every trick in the book. There were lots of Photoshop brushes of like imperfections of photocopiers and old dirty walls and and various scratched up surfaces you could use to kind of create this roughed up texture and and Cameron's designer has applied it without mercy to this album cover. I think the only thing that doesn't have some kind of distressed effect on it is is the artist's face itself. But if you remove all of the filters and effects then actually you're left with something extremely bland. It looks like it may even be Arial. Uh, that Apostrophe looks extremely suspect. I am not enjoying almost anything about this album. So this album is pretty iconic. The typography also is really distinctive. So of its era, I believe it's from uh, T26, um, which was an early digital type distribution uh, foundry. It's so quirky and yet it kind of works perfectly for this application. I would never choose it for anything uh, in any other circumstance, but for some reason it works here. Now seems like as good a time as any to disclaim my complete ignorance of hip hop of this and almost any era. I completely own that ignorance. However, there's a bit to unpack on this album artwork here. I think that the painting, while not the most technically proficient is perfectly fine. However, the way that it's been cropped is very strange. And then on top of that, we have this horrible novelty font, probably something that you would download off of Dar font back in the day. It looks like it might've been based on uh, stencils. Add on top of that, this huge black outer glow effect. And it's just uh, really hitting all the low points of this era in terms of design decisions. While I'm disclaiming my own personal preferences, uh, I do enjoy some of the early Coldplay songs, uh, but other ones just are some of the most irritating things ever composed. But uh, this album artwork, completely on its own merits, this is our first kind of classic album cover. The typography is really strong. The choice of Albertus is, is very classic. Also, the image is really quite timeless considering that it's CGI. It doesn't feel of any particular era because it's such a stylistic choice. Regardless of your feelings about the band, I think this artwork is something that's stood the test of time. There are a lot of things I could say about this uh, Creed cover, um, but I've already said them in a short video separately. So I'm just gonna put this straight in the D tier where it belongs. Dave Matthews is one of those bands that I don't know any of their music, but I think this is one of the stronger kind of conceptual executions. The only thing that really lets it down is this terrible Photoshop work on this shadow being cast by this dude up against the wall. You can see the real shadow next to his feet on the bottom half. An aptly named band for this level of mediocrity. Overall composition, styling and photography is flawless on this one. Typographically speaking, 
It's very of its time, though pretty well executed. I kind of like this take on this genre of display font. Adding a little class to the joint, it's Diana Crawl. Typographic choices are a little dated, but still overall it works fairly well. So many symbols layered in one. It's very obvious what genre this album is for. Little bit over the top with the Photoshop filters, but overall really kind of strong graphic choices. At the bottom, we have the title in a faux spray painted style that's actually really good Photoshop work. And at the top, DMX is in a very strongly distressed effect. It looks as though someone may have made this out of wire and concrete. For the genre and style that it's in, it's kind of deceptively simple. And for that, it's going to get an A ranking. Obviously, classic album, number one seller of the entire year, and obviously had an art directing budget because of that, but what I want to draw your attention to is the detail of the type. This is not something that you saw with 3D rendered stuff in this era. It was not done in 3D. There was no ray tracing uh, in 2002. So somebody went to the effort of making this lettering and lighting it and, and finessing it in Photoshop and the execution is S tier album artwork. Garth Brooks always appears strangely smooth and airbrushed on all his album artwork around this era. An interesting cover with uh, the choice to go kind of grunge just with the texture of the environment uh, with this 3D constructed version of their uh, Infinity Double O. You know, it's very minimal in some ways while also kind of giving your eye a lot of things to look at. Incubus is in a really typical style of the day. Uh, you can almost see the wallet chain attached to it, but next to it setting the title of your album in Arial or some other default sans serif is absolutely a C tier move. The art direction certainly tells you this is world music in terms of genre and there's a lot of stuff going on visually. The only downside I would say is the really tight uh, kerning on the artist's name, but otherwise, you know. Dude looks like somebody attacked his torso with a pair of scissors and he's just only realized. <laughs> uh, apart from that hilarious photo, we also have some amazingly cheap looking CGI bling going on behind here with uh, an extreme amount of drop shadow. What I like about Jay-Z's album here is it's so minimal and straightforward. It's pretty timeless, although the logo kind of gives away the era. It's a very uh, of its time technical stencil style, but executed really well. So the point it still does look cool today. Follow up album, definitely less memorable, but pretty well executed. That gets an A. Almost goes without saying, but obviously the Photoshop work is pretty much flawless. And the logo in the corner, well executed as well for being early CGI. The materials actually feel like they could be highly polished metal, not uh, bad CGI. And uh, my suspicion is that this was a logo that was probably used for touring graphics and other promotional materials, not just used at this tiny size on the album cover. Can we talk a little bit about what a fresh-faced young man John Mayer looks like on this album? I mean, he looks about 14. What a dork. <laughs> I love it. The thing that I don't love, though, is this tiny quarter of a line in this grid that has been left unfinished. That detail alone is bringing it down to a B. This album raises quite a few questions. I don't know if I've ever seen a more rumpled landscape and outfit matching each other with the crossbar that only goes part of the way on the left but extends the full way under Timberlake on the right making me scratch my head or well, like no shoes no shirt no forehead this almost reminds me of that awful taste but great execution subreddit <laughs> almost I can't tell if it's the typographic choices the mullet or the sunglasses but something about this image makes me feel violated the title might say the rebirth of Kirk Franklin, but the typography is saying that Kirk Franklin got held back in kindergarten. When you're making little Bow Wow's artwork look mature by comparison, ugh. Obviously for any other artist, this album would automatically get a D for its artwork, but I believe that the intended effect was discussed. Pretty timeless here. The thing that keeps it out of the S rank is that logo. It just doesn't bear up to scrutiny of the details. For example, the corners of these various lines. Some are pointed, some are truncated. 
Again, we have a case of deceptively judicious use of these effects. This spray effect's not a really crappy Photoshop job. Uh, so there's some points for that. They've been very selective in where they've added these textural elements of random text and some of the paint drips and stuff. This is very well managed. This album, by contrast, has very poor control over its elements. You can see that we have the same kind of stuff going on, but just way too much spray texture. The other off-putting thing is this kind of 3D robot. It's clearly got shading and perspective. And then we have this 2D flat kind of splatter texture over that, which creates a really unsatisfying effect. This illustration is quite cool and would have been difficult to achieve with the tools at the time. So it's even more impressive for doing that. I, I really like the photo illustration on the front. What brings it down a peg is that, again, unnecessary amount of grunge going on in the name Ludacris. Uh, it's amazing how fine the line between seductive and ridiculous can be. What I like about the Photoshop work though is that this strange double T symbol has been made into a fake Photoshop necklace for him as well. But they remembered to connect the two pieces so that the bottom piece wasn't floating in midair. They just neglected to learn how shadows work. <laughs> Body language here is reminding me of case of emotion. But I want to focus down on the typography. It's kind of looking like uh, weevils have attacked the uh, layer effects with glows and strokes and embosses. I hate to do it to an artist that is iconic to many, but this artwork. <sighs> layer effects and Photoshop shadows have not been a friend to Nas in this instance. There's something quite charming about this album cover typographically speaking. Obviously it's referencing the 60s and that psychedelic type movement. Some of the details aren't perfect. It uh, would have served them to redraw the letter forms by hand rather than just distorting them the way they have. But clearly there's a concept and a unique take here. It's a pretty memorable cover compared to the batch overall. A lot of people would like to see me hate on this Nickelback album. Unfortunately, I just feel that a lot of its sins Creed just committed worse. Uh, we have that same kind of grunge cliche of multiple textures and things, but uh, you know, most of the problems with its execution are just mediocre, not terrible. So it only gets a C. This cover stands out for being all lettering only. That kind of hand rendered naive style actually holds up pretty well. So that's gonna go in a fairly high tier. So don't tell my wife because she's a big fan, but something about this artwork is really not working for me. Using a graffiti tag style font gives you the worst of both worlds. Firstly, it doesn't have the finesse of real lettering. And secondly, it has poor legibility as text. Then you have these weird scribbles. I don't know what they were trying to sell me by including it. Was it meant to imply that this graffiti was real and not a Photoshop layer? It just hasn't worked. For as over the top as this album design might appear, the lighting is actually pretty consistent and the Photoshop shadows are not done poorly. There's a few lens flares going on, you know, but it kind of makes sense with the metallic effect. Even though it might be a little cheesy, I think overall it achieves what it sets out to do. So this is the first hand-painted album that we've seen, I think, and uh, all art is subjective, but for me, this is bad, and uh, whoever made it should feel bad. Rob Zombie over anybody else might have actual legitimate reason to splatter his album with blood, but actually what he's done is fairly subdued. The color more than anything really grabs your eye, and uh, for that, this one gets a B. So as opposed to the Chili Peppers album, this painting, regardless of how you feel about the particular style or details, clearly was made by somebody with a lot of skill. I have to admit that this artwork is quite impressive and that earns it a place at the top. Shakira's Photoshop work here, pretty dodgy. Uh, not only the faux tattoo, but also the strange um, enhanced shadow that's gone over her shoulder. Um, bit of a head scratcher. The photograph looks like it could have been shot out of a moving bus, but the lettering for the band name is actually quite cool. I like the brushwork. There's clear contrast between thick and thin strokes, and this must have been done by someone 
with quite some skill. Sting. That is Trebuchet, a default font from Microsoft. One more friendly reminder that this is not a commentary about any of these musicians, it's purely about the artwork, but I have to say, there is nothing about this artwork that I like. It's PP, it's doo doo, and it's uh, wee wee. Execution, awful. Photograph itself is just smudgy and gross and lacking in detail. Photo editing is, is weirdly patchy and inconsistent. The cropping of the photo even, there's not even an even margin on left and right from where the lettering starts and ends. And then the distressed grunge type that looks like it's been put through a meat grinder has an additional drop shadow to even reduce legibility further. It's really not about the style, it's about terrible execution. Because I can imagine a version of this album which would be like a C or even a B. This ain't it. Doesn't resemble anything else on this chart. It's clearly analog media. And regardless of what you think of this aesthetic, it is executed extremely well. Based on this artwork, I would shut that circus down. Mediocrity Incarnate. This manages to go below even the low bar set by our previous Toby Keith album with this confusingly shoddy doghouse that somebody went to the effort of making needlessly distressed text along with all the Dutch angles going on. That is bottom tier. Vanessa Carlton's Art Nouveau throwback is unlike anything else that we've seen in the charts. It's referencing a very famous poster by the artist Alphonse Mucha. Unfortunately, it falls so short of the thing that it's referencing. I mean, Mucha was basically a genius. And unfortunately, the details of this artwork only remind you how far from genius this is. So that completes our tier list for the album art of 2002. Uh, some interesting items along the way, but uh, let's have a look at how the music scores lined up with those tiers. So beginning with our C tier, the average overall score for these albums was 64.1%. If we go up to tier B, we get 67.6%. A tier, we get 68.3%. S tier, we get 73.5%. So, so far, the higher the tier, the better the score. Looking at our final tier, the D tier albums, they scored 67.5% on average, which is better than the score for the C tier albums and only 0.1% different from the B tier albums. So unfortunately, it kind of breaks the idea that the better the design, the better the quality of music. If your music is good enough, people will buy it despite the hideous artwork. But if we sort instead by average rating score, our bottom three albums got a C tier score. Conversely, our top rated albums, which got S tier, S tier and D tier. So make of that what you will. The final comparison I wanted to make was, did they have grunge typography? Yes or no? Because our original premise was, can you judge an album by its font? And overall, albums that had grunge fonts averaged a score of 63.3, whereas the albums which did not use grunge or distressed fonts averaged 66.7. <laughs> so not an enormous disparity, but if you see an album from 2002, if it has grunge typography, it's likely slightly worse music than an album with clean typography. So did those results surprise you at all? Which was your favorite and least favorite album cover and why? And if you want me to repeat this experiment to check it's not a fluke, which year would you pick? Please let me know down in the comments. And if nothing else, leaving a thumbs up really helps out the channel. So I'd really appreciate that. As always, my name is Linus. Thank you so much for watching. And I hope I'll see you in a future video.